Welcome to San Francisco. We're here at the uh, GU ASCO conference for 2016, and I'm joined by two old friends uh, who are experts in the field of urological oncology, Peter Iverson from Copenhagen in Denmark, and Heather Payne, a radiation oncologist or a clinical oncologist as we call them in the UK, uh, in London. I'm Noel Clark. I'm a urological oncologist from Manchester. We've had uh, some fascinating insights into new developments and some remarkably good data from trials uh, from Europe, from the USA and other parts of the world, and we're going to share those with you uh, this evening. Now, Heather, I'm going to come to you first because we've had uh, a couple of major studies which have been uh, reported um, mm. on uh, radiotherapy. Uh, RTOG0415, uh, which was a randomized phase three non-inferiority study uh, comparing fractionation schedules in low-risk prostate cancer. And then secondly, the CHIP study, uh, a very large-scale study, um, yeah, which has uh, been looked at looking at hyperfractionation schedules uh, in intermediate risk. So just give me your thoughts on RTOG 0415. I, mean, I think just as background, hypofractionation for prostate cancer was thought possibly to be beneficial because prostate cancer cells are likely to respond to a smaller number of big doses of radiotherapy as a result of something called the alpha-beta ratio. Now, the first study, and it's great to see radiotherapy studies in, in prostate cancer, we had a lot of it in this meeting, which has been fantastic. The, the first study showed non-inferiority between a standard and a hypofractionated regime. But my only thoughts on that study were that these were men with really low risk disease. And certainly in, in our practice, they would probably have active surveillance. Mm. Um, so though it was non-inferior, and it's great to see hypofractionation being investigated, I don't know if I, well, I wouldn't treat somebody with low risk disease. Um, I think it was a study of its time, wasn't it? Mm. And uh, as in planning all of these studies, uh, one starts off with a, uh, an intention and the world moves on. Mm. And the world had clearly moved on, but the results were nevertheless mm. uh, valid. Probably more relevant were the um, CHIP results because intermediate risk prostate cancer, Peter, if I can come to you on this, mm -hmm. um, is a disease which we would treat actively. Mm. Now, the results were really very good, I thought. Yeah, it's... Uh it's a huge study, recruiting almost three, or more than 3,000 patients, actually. And uh, it's a three-arm study, having a standard arm of, of 74 gray, uh, and then uh, comparing it to two hyperfractionated dosages of uh, three gray per day, 20 days versus, if I remember correctly, 19 days. Yeah. Um, and uh, even though the, the study was not powered for uh, looking uh, for statistically comparing the two um, the two uh, hyperfractionated dosage schedules, an interesting difference appeared between the uh, the 19 day schedule and the 20 day schedule, which was fascinating to me that mm. a difference actually might appear with only one day's difference. Um, what I'm thinking. There was uh, there, the uh, there was no inferiority between the uh, the conventional dosage of uh, 74 gray and the 60 gray uh, uh, hyperfractionation uh, dosage schedule, uh, which of course is interesting. Uh, what I'm a bit concerned about is the follow-up because it was actually suggested by the uh, by the uh, uh, by Dr. Donnelly who presented the study that this was enough now to change our standard of, of, of care when it comes to radiotherapy. I'm only a urologist, but I'm, I'm wondering if five years of, of median follow-up, which was the case here, is enough really to conclude that you can change the, the standard of, of care in, in this. Um. Mm. Yeah, and it was interesting because the toxicity data was quite encouraging. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there was a specific question which was put to David Dernley from the audience uh, by a senior member um, to the effect that five years wasn't long enough to assess the, uh, the, the side effects. I don't know, Heather, if you have a view about that. I mean, it was a median, wasn't it? And I mm. think there's a lot of experience in the UK of using hypofractionated regimes and following patients up for longer. And the majority of late side effects you're probably going to see between two and five years. And there's going to be a small number of very late ones. But I think the data is sufficient 
to change practice for intermediate risk disease. And David Durnley made the very valid point that if, if, you, uh, if you're going to get serious late side effects, you will often get uh, quite pronounced early side effects. And clearly, they, they weren't mm. seen in the CHIP trial, which was really quite encouraging, mm. I thought. So as a serious prostatectomist, Peter, um, should we give up? Should we hand all the patients over to the radiation oncologist? Well, I don't think you can co conclude based on this study that we should give up surgery. <laughs> this was a comparison of two radiotherapy schedules, or, or three schedules actually. Uh, so uh, no, I'm not. Go you're not going to hear me say that we should give up <laughs> radical prostatectomy. Not based on this, at least. There might be other reasons. Now there is another study which is uh, which was read at this uh, this meeting by Bill Shipley, mm -hmm. um, a subject quite close to your heart, which is the use of uh, bicalutamide, right? Um, and some quite interesting results, I thought. Yeah, we have been waiting for these results mm -hmm. for some mm -hmm. time actually, and um, the, the study was a two-arm study, um, including I think it was 760 men with uh, uh, rising PSA following radical prostatectomy. Uh, between salvage uh, radiotherapy without endocrine therapy versus salvage radiotherapy plus 24 months of bicalutamide, 150 milligram daily. And um, I have seen data before showing a difference in time to metastasis mm. and in uh, cancer-specific survival. But now there is a difference actually in overall survival with approximately 13 years of median follow-up. So that's a very mature study. Mm -hmm. And uh, one, one comment which Bill made, which was that this was old style prostate cancer, um, right. that uh, there were much more advanced cases. Sitting and listening to that and knowing the data from the radical study, which was mentioned, um, I, was, I didn't agree with him. Uh, what I know is from the recruitment of the radical study is that 60% of the patients going into that study are actually T3. Right. Um, so when we're looking at, at uh, hormonal schedules, which we will ultimately do with a modern trial, which you're closely involved with, the radical study, um, we may well see a confirmation of what Bill Shipley and the, uh, the Boston team have started to show us with this early study. It really is quite promising, I right. think. I think I've always been biased by the fact that in, in, um, in the high-risk and locally advanced disease where the prostate is still in place, we have shown very convincingly mm. that the addition of, of endocrine therapy as adjuvant endocrine therapy has made a tremendous difference. So I, I've always suspected that that would be the case also in the cell situation, how, albeit the prostate is not there anymore. Yeah. It makes complete sense, doesn't it? It, it makes sense. It makes sense. It's such well-established data. And it's but, it, see, yeah. it, but it leaves us with a couple of problems, I would say. What is the optimal schedule? Is it, is it really 24 months? And are we going to use bicalutamide today with all the new modalities we have in hand? I think that's going to be an issue for debate, really. I must admit, for my salvage patients, that I would choose bicalutamide. Well, that's Quite interesting. Often I give patients a choice, but I think bicalutamide has advantages with no risk of osteoporosis, that some more men retain libido, sort of energy levels, obviously at the cost of mm -hmm. gynecomastia. But I think it's a better, in, in, for some men, it's a better tolerated drug when you weigh up the different yeah, In terms of quality of life, maybe, but uh, if, if we talk efficacy, we, we don't have any head-to-head -head comparisons no. between an anti-antigen and an and LHI agonist. We well, will perhaps be able to compare the, 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 the various studies. Uh, radicals in its hormonal element has recruited mm. 2,800 patients. Uh, there's a Jetug study as well, which is uh, similar in, in, its, uh, in its design. So hopefully we'll be able to answer mm. that question. But also the EPC showed a survival benefit, didn't it, for locally the advanced EB, with adjuvant The, the EPC uh, showed the early data. prostate cancer yeah, trial. Yeah, there was the yeah. early prostate cancer trial with uh, bigalutamide. There was a difference uh, between uh, bigalutamide as adjuvant therapy compared to placebo. Mm. And the difference was very similar to what we yeah. have seen with LHI agonist. Yeah. But so it again, was not a direct comparison. But extrapolating that, you'd sort of think that there I is agree. a role for bigalutamide in adjuvant therapy. Yeah. So sticking with the hormonal theme and uh, combined therapies, Stampede, which is a remarkable study, which you and I... Uh, Becoming more and more remarkable. We, we've been very closely involved with it, so we're very proud of it. Uh, so we talk about it all the time, <laughs> even in our spare time. Um, but some interesting data from, from uh, Stampede emerging in, a, in a, a rather unexpected way, Heather. 
I mean, I, I don't think anybody really saw that one coming, did they? That the, the well. fact that <laughs> well, I didn't. No. But, um, but, um, but looking at the combination of zolodonic acid and salicoxib showing a, a survival advantage, and whether that's an additive effect or whether it's synergistic, I don't think we quite know yet. Well, the interesting thing, uh, uh, having been very close to this as part of the trial management group, uh, the, uh, the, the celecoxib and zoledronic acid part was stopped because of failure-free survival issues, and 80% of that was PSA-based. Mm -hmm. Now, what we know from pathophysiology is that celecoxib and zoledronic acid would work in a different way, likely to be in the bone, and the year improvement in patient survival was only in those patients with metastatic disease. Mm. No effect on the primary. Mm. Fascinating uh, physiologically, mm. uh, and I think a lot of work to do. There are a number mm. of reasons why, but the, the, the difference is so big, it seems to be unlikely to be due to chance to me. Mm. Peter, you, you had a quick look at that, uh, that data. You've not had a chance to scrutinize it. Um, but it is very different, isn't it? No, I'm surprised and, and, and trying to think of, of, of some kind of explanation. I mean, uh, silicoxib, uh, there is a rationale for, for slowing down tumor progression. And when you, when you go to the old uh, uh, papers on solidronic acid, if you go to the first study reported by Fred Sart, there was actually a difference in survival. It was not statistically significant, mm -hmm. but it was there, and if I remember correctly, the hazard ratio was in the range of 1.20. Yeah. So I don't know if we already saw this trend at, at, at that time and, and now it's becoming more clear in a, in, a, in a larger group. If there is a synergy or added effect uh, with the acylococcyp, I don't know. Well, it's a fascinating it's uh, a, story. But, but it was interesting to hear the American um, uh, yeah. remarks to, to the results. Uh, uh, actually uh, stating that this probably would never fly because of the cardiovascular problems with silicoxy. Mm -hmm. Now, I found that an absolutely fascinating uh, statement um, because the hazard ratio for stamp the stampede silicoxy and zoledronic acid is very large and a survival in metastatic and improvement in survival of one year. Mm. Well, if that had been charted in ASCO in 2014, that would have made big, big headlines. Mm. So I think that story is going to run and run. <laughs> so we've had a fascinating time uh, here at GU ASCO uh, in San Francisco. Uh, there is more to come. I hope our discussions have been informative and helpful. It's certainly been food for thought listening to um, the opinions of my friends and colleagues and uh, it's been food for thought listening to the data coming out of the meeting. Thanks very much for listening.